Hi, Ricky. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Let me turn the volume up a little bit here. Okay. Put glasses on. Okay, there we go. Yeah, it's a bit like I'm that. I'm great. <laughs> good, man. Good. Oh, I love your back wall, by the way. That's very impressive. That's my ego wall. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> I, try to, I try to get it goes. It goes up, but it goes down. It goes down. And I try to give the impression that I'm a big wig. I figure I'm going to show people in Australia who don't know who I am. If they see all these golden platinum records, they're going to get the illusion that I'm somebody important. So there you go. <laughs> well, uh, well, eh, I think well, I think people who do know who you are do know um, uh, do know who you are pretty much. And, and the and the illusion. Good point, by the way, because I do. One of the first times I remember growing up as a kid is seeing your name was in the in the gatefold use your illusion albums ricky rackman i remember seeing that there because i was brought up in the uk so we still have the right. bit, bit of the disconnect with america there and then you know you're in the video and then headbangers balls and mtv and oh, so i know who you are so. the, the funny thing is uh that's something that's really changed like when we were kids and we were listening to records, we would put the record on, and we would sit down on the floor and open the album cover and read every little bit of it. Nobody does that anymore. I mean, you look for lyric sheets. That was something that I think is really lost. Like, people aren't sitting on the floor with the album cover. You know, that's the one thing. And I even talk about it in my show a little bit, because vinyl is very popular in America right now. But I don't think everybody's taking the time to listen to vinyl correctly. Yeah, and that's very important. Is to look at the album cover. Yeah, well, that was I made and was with the best one. Like, cause you just you get lost in their cover, never mind anything else. And then you know, you, yeah, and, and you just go from there. Now with human, I used to listen to the lyrics. I read the lyrics over and over again. I'd look at the the thank yous that were in there, and you'd start to see names. And on what the thank yous would do, you'd go, oh, they've mentioned this band. I'm going to go and check out this band. Right. And, and and it does and I'm with you as well. I think the, the the album concept has has died now because everything's now streamed. You can just go and listen to two or three songs, and that's your lot. I was such a jerk. It's like the first thing I do when it, God, is, I hate admitting this. As soon as an album would come out, I'd look to see if my name was in the thing. <laughs> and it's bad, but but a lot of times it was. And sometimes it was in bands, it's like, why am I being thanked in, in your album? You know, like, I'd have no idea. Not only to use Your Illusion, in, which I have, all of them, but in the Spaghetti Incident, yeah. in the Spaghetti Incident, I even sang background vocals on one of the songs, The Fear, I Don't Care About You, I sang background vocals on that. You yes. can't tell. But I got to go in the studio and I got my name on the, on the record as background vocals, so that's kind of cool. Take it, take it. But, and, and oh, I do. Yeah, and, that, and that's a great song. I think that's the one that, that goes into um, Look at Your Game Girl. Maybe. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, the, I think that's the hidden tracks on the end of that one because it's such a great song as well. And I actually think it's a really good version uh, of the Fear song as well. Um, and, and, look, and obviously, you just mentioned it as well. I mean, you come into Australia very shortly. Um, at the moment, I know you're in America doing your One Foot in the Gutter tour. It talks that the headline is tapes on rock and roll sleaze and debauchery. <laughs> we'll get to that shortly. But what was the fire behind you doing this at this stage of your career? Everybody was always asking me to, I was getting asked quite a bit if I was going to write a book because everybody's coming out with a book and I had so many incredible stories. And one day I decided, what if I just get on stage and tell these stories and the show is incredible. But my first show was like over three hours. So I'm like, okay, I can't do a three hour show. So then I started, then I got booked on some more shows. So I started adding video aspect and adding photos and all these other things and kind of goofy things and fun things. And, you know, it's a rags to riches, like doing very well to being really, really down. And I tell that story. And the other thing is, I wasn't sure. If I wrote a book, if people wanted to hear the story I wanted to tell, because and I apologize for the parrot in the background. Um, <laughs> oh, good. It was. It was uh, I wasn't sure if people wanted to hear the stories about the demons and the battles that I had, but I put them in this show, and people do. And some people, for some reason, say they get inspiration from the show, and it's really funny, and it's 
it, I mean, I, it's weird for me to talk about myself in this, but the reviews have been great. And I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to bring to Australia because there's a lot of people in Australia that know me from Cat House because you didn't get Headbangers Ball out there. Yeah. So I'm going to talk, I, what I'm going to try to do is really describe the Hollywood scene. And I'm going to write a whole different script and bring everybody with me into the 80s in Hollywood when, you know, my friends were getting record deals and, you know, we were doing all sorts of bad stuff and, and what the whole scene was like in the 80s. And if some people don't know what Headbangers Ball was, I'm also going to bring some of the clips of that show to show you, you know, about what that show was. Because there's, there's some episodes that, like, in America are pretty crazy and pretty well known. And I dissect those episodes in the show. So it's it's fun. I mean, I, I hate that so many people call it nostalgic, but it is. Yeah, it is. And, 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 and that was going to be my next question, actually, because, I mean, I, I knew of you. Like, once I, I saw the Usual Illusion stuff and then went backwards from that point, because I was 13 when it came out, and then went backwards. I and mean, I was all Guns N' Roses at that point. You know, you knew about the Cat House, you knew about the, um, you know, the Roxy and, and the Rainbow and all that sort of thing. And as a 13-year-old, like, you saw the hedonism. Like, you could see it quite clearly. And, you, you know, Motley Crue were doing their thing and everything else. So, I mean, the, and, and you became such a, and I know I'm not stroking your ego, bollocks to you on that, but you became such a, a key part in that scene. Like, there wasn't anything going on that you were kind of, hi, here I am, and then to Headbangers Ball. So how did that all come about that, you know, you had this club, uh, then you get to become Headbangers Ball, and... I mean, you're not a music. Well, you were in bands, but you weren't known as a musician. Yet you're so in there. My inner circle, everybody was getting record deals, and all my friends are becoming rock stars. And I was like, God, I want to do that stuff. I want to do that stuff. And the cat house just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, very nonchalantly, I said to Axel, I was like, Man, I'd like to do that show, Headbangers Ball. He's like. Do you want me to call up and set up an audition? I'm like, yes, Axel Rose, I would like you to. <laughs> Not thinking he would. And he called up and he flew with me to New York for my audition. So that, of course, helped a lot because I had never been in front of a TV camera until I was on that show. And then the show just got bigger and bigger and bigger. But it was, it was weird that people knew who I was purely because I was the guy that owned the cat house. And as much as you think, you know, you've heard crazy stories about the rainbow and the sunset strip at the cat house, it was, I mean, any kind of decadence that you might have heard, it was tripled at the cat house. I mean, it really was a totally different time, a time that in no way could ever be duplicated. Well, I was actually, it was good you've mentioned that, because that was actually going to be one of my last questions, uh, but we'll, we'll jump to that right now. Um, I know you said nostalgia earlier, and times have massively changed. And what we remember of the 80s, like, do, do, do you think it's, how, how do you view that now? Like, because, you know, for better or for worse, times have changed. So how do you view that? Do you sit and cringe at some of it? Or do you think, oh, that was just amazing? Both. Uh, but see, people got the wrong idea. The Cat House became notorious because of the reputation of the women that went to the cat house and some of the women dressed with very revealing clothes and they looked like strippers or they looked like porn stars because some of them were strippers and porn stars. But there were also women that would go there that might be school teachers or own businesses or who were housewives and they went to the cat house and played. And, and just cause like they dressed, you know, so sleazy, that didn't mean they were, it was sort of cosplay and nobody, really was objectifying women, but it was sort of a place where you could just have fun and every guy was a rock star and every girl was a stripper, even though they weren't. And now, and I, in my show, and I'll probably bring some excerpts of that into the Australia show as well, you couldn't do that today. And some of the things that, that we did, and like if you look at some album covers and you look like a Scorpions album cover, oh, does that look offensive? Absolutely. Is it like, is it degrading to women? <laughs> Absolutely. It, th there's some stuff that happens that was wrong. But I was one of the few people that go like, okay, this with a dog in the cage and the, no, that's, that, that was a little bit offensive. Not in a cool way, but I think everything that we did was just kind of a little bit dirty, but in a really fun way. 
And some of that stuff, especially in America, is you can't do that anymore. You know, get in trouble for saying somebody looks sexy. Mm. So it's just it's just a completely different time. And I miss that because at the Cat House, we were very accepting. We really didn't care if you were straight, gay, what color, big, small. It didn't matter. But I know that, you know, people look at certain things a certain way these days. And, you know, that's why those times could never be duplicated. When you, you mentioned earlier about the, you know, the supposed the riches to the rags and then to the riches. Um, and, and that you're surprised that people are intrigued in that. Um, why? Why are you surprised? Because I don't think anybody knew how low it got for me. People didn't know about me going to jail. People didn't know about me going completely broke until I had to get a job wearing a suit and tie selling cars until the power got turned off in my apartment. You know, nobody knew that it actually got that low. And that then I ended up working and I never stopped working and built it up to radio and was doing more radio and started an apparel line and now I'm doing these shows so you know I don't think anybody knew how bad it got because you don't publicize that stuff but I'm I have no problem telling everybody that story and telling and uh you know there's there's people that I've met at shows that are going through really really hard times that feel like giving up and I went through some really hard times but I never ever gave up and some of the bad times that I had led me in a direction that I wouldn't have been in that direction if I hadn't gone through those bad mm. times. Does that make any sense? It makes perfect sense, yeah. So yeah. that's why, you know, that the old cliche when says, everything happens for a reason. When you're in a really low place and somebody says that to you, you're like, Grr. you know, but sometimes there's things that are bad that happen. And if they didn't happen, that really good thing would have happened down the road. Yeah, yeah, true, 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 true. Um, <laughs> I've written this down. I'm going to ask anyway. So, Slash, of all people, is quoted as saying that you were a bad influence on Axel. That's a big call. That's, that's when I knew I had a problem. Okay. When the most notorious, most notorious rock and roll band in the world is saying that you're like kind of a bad influence on Axel because we were doing a lot of drugs then. Uh, Slash and Duff, I talked to maybe a couple days ago. And the turnaround, I think more than anybody in our scene, the turnaround of how Slash is and how Duff is, they're beautiful people. They're very intelligent, very kind, and they were not like that back in the day. But yeah, I did a lot of drugs back then. And uh, obviously it was something that was very bad and something negative and something that affected my life in a bad way. And I, I, I can't say, oh, I really regret that because I got clean. And the battles that I went through, you know, maybe somebody else went through those same battles. Yeah. So where are you at now? What's Ricky Ratman's life today? I live in North Carolina. I mean, in my opinion, I've got it pretty good because I'm married to this beautiful French girl that is also one of the best tattoo artists in the, you know, anywhere. Nice. It's like, that's kind of cool, right? Like, yeah. that's kind of like... Oh, she's gorgeous. She's French, and she's the best. She was on a. I don't know if you ever got it. But there was an American TV show called the Ink Master. Oh yeah, and yeah. She, yeah. Well, she was on season one, and I was supposed to be the host for that show. And at the last minute, they said that they wouldn't give it to me. They gave it to Dave Navarro. Well, because I got that, because I got turned down, I ended up meeting her ten years later, and we ended up getting married. If I was the host. We never would have been married. So that's that's like an example of a bad thing that ended up turning good. I live in North Carolina. I'm out of Hollywood. I'm starting to do these shows. I also have a, a website called cathousehollywood.com where we sell cat house shirts and headbangers, ball shirts and coffee. And right now I'm really at a turning point. Six months ago I had a nationally syndicated radio show that I had been doing for 20 years and I worked in racing. And that all ended right when I started going on tour. So I think that right now I'm at a turning point. I remember saying, well, if I could do anything in 2023, I'd like to do 20 shows and do a show in another country. And I've done 20 shows now and I'm going to Australia. So I don't know where everything's going to lead. And, and even though I'm old as dirt, I still try to, I still sort of reinvent myself, 
but I never, I never give up, and I, oh, I don't know where it's going to end up. But I know that when I'm on stage, whether I'm in front of, on stage in front of 800 people or I'm on stage in front of 50, I love it. I, it's more rewarding than anything I've ever done. And when you hear all of your friends talking about, hey, we're on tour, we're going on tour, I've heard that my whole life, and I was always like, oh man, I'm so jealous. And now, for the first time in my life, I'm on tour. I get to go on tour, and I get to talk about venues that they were in. And I'm on tour in a band, so I'm really kind of doing it old school, and I, I love it. I love I love the feeling of going on stage in front of people that I don't know and telling my stories. And the whole idea of getting to do four shows in Australia is mind-blowing. It's more than I could have ever dreamed of, and I'm excited because I've never been to Australia. So that's also very exciting to me. Yeah, good, good. I'm, I'm excited to see it as well. When Danny um, announced it a couple of months ago... You could see straight away the chatter from everyone was like, fuck, really? Like, that guy's coming out here. (laughs) I have no idea. Like, I have no idea. Am I going to show up there and there's going to be four people there? I have no idea how it's going to go because it's, you know, I don't know if everybody knows me, but we're going to have fun. I promise you the people that show up have fun. I hope everybody buys tickets because if I walked into some of these little clubs or bars and it was packed, I'd be like, like, it'd be surreal. (laughs) I can't wait. It'll be great. Well, I think I've only got 15 minutes and we've used 16. So, um, look, I'll hopefully see. I think you I'm in Adelaide. I think you're here June 3rd. Um, you yeah, playing just. I, I, I don't know anything about Adelaide. That's where the first ship. Uh, okay. Obviously, you need shit. Okay. So, look, uh, the things when I moved to Adelaide, the first things I heard were. Uh, it's the serial killer capital of the world. If you want to put that in okay, there, hold on. let me write that down. <laughs> okay, so far we're going good. So yeah, it's the serial killer capital of the world. Of the world. Yes. Of the world. Per capita, there's more serial killers here than than anywhere else. Um, okay. There's a lot of churches. It's known as the city of churches. There's a lot of churches. Um, That's odd. We have both of those. Is it that more, odd? Lots <laughs> of churches and more serial killers than anywhere else in the world. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Um, that That's what I would go with. They were the first two things, yeah. So when you start to do your research, you'll start to pick them things up about Adelaide. But um, yeah, we're a cool little town. We're a cool town. I think you're here June 3rd, which is a week, two weeks on Saturday, isn't it? Yeah, so it's I think crazy. You're then. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow morning for four more shows, like Nashville and Atlanta, and I've got four more shows. And then I come home, pretty much just in time to get ready to go to Australia. And I'll be in Australia for two weeks because after the Brisbane show, I have like a couple of days off and then I do Melbourne and Sydney and I want to take a couple of days off in Sydney. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to spending a little time in Australia because when I do shows, I'll do a show and then early in the morning I'm driving all day. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to just to doing the 